15 years. First, I don't know, Ron and I haven't been together on Sunday morning at all. We've been traveling for nine weeks in churches, two churches a week. But on Sunday, we're never together. So we don't really have our act together this morning, what he's, well, we do, kind of. But we were in Volgograd for about nine years, southern Russia. And after living there for nine years, we planted three churches. And then the Alliance said that we needed to spread out. We needed to go north and east. And they also wanted us to work with another mission. We had been working with one organization the whole time we were there. And at this time, they wanted us to work with a small mission. So they said, you pick a church, pray about it, pick a church. And we saw the list. Ron's been on field leadership for years, and he knew the list of the large cities that were target areas in Russia. And we prayed about it. And little did we know at the time, seven years before that, we had taken, with our two youngest children, Jared and Jenna, we had taken a trip down the Volga River from Moscow to Volgograd. It takes seven days. At that time, it cost $40 a person. Now, is that cheap or is that cheap? Um, we've been like three other times at the same price, but Ron checked this year. It has gone to seven hundred and fifty dollars a person. Oh my So inflation has hit big time. So we didn't take it this year, but it's a wonderful trip. Every day you're on this ship, you have a coupe. It's a coupe is a cabin, I guess in English. It has four beds, two sets of bunk beds, and it even has a little sink in there, and then the bathroom is down the hall. It's not a five-star ship. It's a Russian ship, but we love it. And every day, it stops in a different city. There's like 10, 14 different cities along the river, major cities. And every day, it stops at one or two. And they'll tell you that you have maybe four hours there or six hours and you can get off the ship. We knew Russian, so we didn't need a translator or a tour guide, we'd rather be on our own. And you go into cities and you see all kinds of things and buy different things. We loved it. Well, one of those cities was Nizhny Novgorod. We have pictures of Jenna at nine years old uh, sitting by a bank and then Jared and Jenna by a church that you'll see this morning. You'll see both of them this morning. Little did we know that at this time in our life, we would be living and ministering in Nizhny Novgorod. It's a city of 2.4 million people. It's uh, 250 miles northeast of Moscow. And it's where the Volga and the Volga River and the Aka River come together. It's a very beautiful city. Okay, I'd like to share this one verse. It's in the last chapter of Ephesians. And Paul is sitting someplace. Where do you suppose, when he asked for the Christian church to pray for him, where do you suppose he's sitting? In jail. He's in jail. Now, what did he do? Did he steal something, murder somebody? What did he do? He preached the gospel. And I have heard a lot about prisons here in America, that they're nice. They have wall-to-wall -wall carpet, they have TVs, probably big screen TVs now. They've got it all. Air conditioning, yes. And they've got heat when it's cold. But I don't think Paul, sitting in here in prison, I don't think he had all those things. I don't think he could take continuing education or get a master's degree in the prison where he was sitting. But he was sitting there, and I think about, if I were there in his position, in that cold, damp, dark probably, not much food, what would be my, my prayer or my request to the Christian church to pray for me? Let me out. Let me out. That's exactly probably what I'd be saying. Pray that God will let me out of here. It's terrible. But here's Paul's prayer, he, the prayer that he wants the church to pray for him. Pray also for me 
that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel of, for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I see three things in this scripture that Paul's asking for. And this is our request to you, that as we go back to Russia, that you will pray these three prayers that I'm going to mention, that you will pray for us in that way. The first one, he says, the when, the, that whenever I open my mouth, it's opportunity. And we do church planning. And when we walk out of our house, my mind is always rolling opportunities, opportunities. When we go to market, we go to market probably just about every day, every other day. It's an open air market. I love it so much better than, I don't know what you hear, Publix or Kroger's or whatever. I like to go and the big cow will be there. And I'll say, hmm, I think I'll take that piece right down along the spine. Hey, filet mignon's the same price as hamburger, so which would you rather have? We love to go to market, but when we go to market, we go to the same man that sells potatoes. We go to him all the time. Not that his potatoes are any better than anybody else's. And the same lady for tomatoes, or for nuts, or for fruit. We go to the same people all the time. Why? Because we're building relationships. We're getting a contact with them so that when we have an event at our church, at our Bible study, they know us, they have some trust in us, and there's a more of a chance of them coming to our uh, event if we have been buying from them and know them. Because they ask us, oh, why are you, are you Americans? Actually, they don't think we're Americans from our accent. They think we are from the Baltic states. <laughs> And uh, that's a compliment, because Baltic states, they speak uh, Russian there. So it's a compliment. But then we tell them we're for Americans, and they say, why are you here? And then that opens the window of opportunity, the whenever of opportunity that Paul is talking about here. And then he talks about, uh, words may be given me. That's for wisdom. Pray first that God will give us opportunity. And then, words of wisdom. We come into many situations. We've never been in that situation before. We don't know what to say. But pray for us that God will give us wisdom. And then the last one is, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Pray that we'll be bold in our witness. Sometimes, Usually, it's very easy to be open and tell what we're doing, but there's sometimes that we're scared because of who we're talking to that it might not be a good thing to say that we're Christians, that we're Protestant, that we're missionaries. So pray that God will help us to be bold in our witness as we minister to the Russian people. I'm going to, I have been delegated by the boss, um, He's not the boss. He just thinks he is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like that. I like you. <laughs> Who was that? Um, Francis. So he requested that I do the first two sections this morning. And he usually does the first section. And if there's anybody that's interested in history, talk to him. He just will go on an hour and a half on this uh, first section. And I don't even know what time we're supposed to be out of here. What? 10 30. Oh, okay. Okay. Living the call <coughs> together. That's what... That's what the theme is. And we've never had problems with this. Require batteries. <laughs> Two of them. And... Um, now I can see over here. Oh, ways. Okay, living the call together. And living the call together, that means you and that means us. Without you, 
we could not do it. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Living the call together in Nishi no Korda. That is the city that we live in, that we minister in. It, back in communist days, it was called Gorky. Before communist days, it was Nishi no Korda. Then the communists turned it into Gorky. And now, the, after 95 and 91, they turn it back to Nishino Quarter. And that's where Nizhny is, in Russia. When our family went on vacation, oh, Jenna was four years old. If you remember Jenna, we have three boys, for you that don't know, we have three boys and then a daughter. When Jenna was four years old, we took a trip out west. And you know how teenagers are, or preteens, they like to sleep a lot. So early in the morning, we might be pulling into a campsite or into a park. And Jenna would be right up there to have her picture taken. The boys never wanted to be up there on the wall of the different national parks out west. So Jenna wasn't there, so Ron was so happy to crawl up there for us. Here's the bank. It looks like a castle. It looks too fancy to be a bank, but this is a bank right in the center of Nizhny. The regional government headquarters, this is one grounds that in the city that they really keep it up nice. They keep the trees trimmed, the bushes trimmed, there's flowers. That's the thing with Russia. They built beautiful, beautiful buildings the architecture in them, they're incredible. But when it comes to keeping it up, they don't keep it up. They're redoing a lot of things now in the major cities, but they just haven't kept it up over the years. Here's some military vehicles at the Kremlin. When you think of the Kremlin, you might think of Moscow. There's the main Kremlin in Moscow, but the word Kremlin means fortress, and major cities have a fortress, and here's our part of our fortress. It's a big, it goes all around, not all around the city, but around the main part of the city, and it's really beautiful. This fella here flew from, anybody know? From Nizhny Novgorod to Vancouver, Canada in 1937. Yes. And he, you know, and I wanted the name of the man that um, oh, he was contemporary with um, Lindbergh. Lindbergh, yes. So Russians were right up there 